Good evening and welcome to Wallace and Watch, which is a wildlife and nature programme which will be shown in different parts in Nottingham and Nottinghamshire. Today we've got a little bit of a stargazing theme, so one for the budding astronomers out there. But we will also be catching up with more nature enthusiasts and getting to know some very special animals. And please don't forget to join in with us on, on also on our social media. We're at NotForSAC and we'd like you to please use the hashtag Wilson Watch. So to kick off today's programme, we're going to head up onto the roof of Woolerton Hall to start to look at the night sky. Hello, I'm Sue Mallander and I'm a Learning Programmes Officer for Science at Woolerton Hall and we're here on top of the roof of Woolerton Hall, right on top of the prospect room. We can see all the way around. It's the 23rd of October and we can see the moon in all its glory because we can see the side of it so that's the best time to look at the moon and we'll hopefully we'll see some other planets and, and other things as well and we have a real astronomer up here with us which is Mike Merrifield. Hello I'm Michael Merrifield I'm professor of astronomy at the University of Nottingham I spend a lot of my time looking at very very distant objects in the far reaches of the universe um, using very big telescopes but right now I'm also on the top of Woolerton Hall and enjoying looking at some of our relatively nearby neighbours, a few of the planets uh, and the moon uh, and it's a particularly good time to be looking at the moon at the moment because it's about half full and what that means is that half the moon is in sunlight and half of it is in night time in shade uh, and that's a good time because that means that even the side that's in sunlight the sun's not directly overhead on that bit of the moon which means there are lots of shadows and when you point a telescope at the moon when there are lots of shadows you can really see all the craters and mountains on the moon. Okay, so the telescope's pointing at Jupiter at the moment, uh, one of the more spectacular planets in the solar system. Um, and so I can show you what the telescope is seeing at the moment. So the big bright light in the middle, which is very overexposed, is Jupiter itself. And then the little dots you can see on either side of it are some of the moons of Jupiter. This is something you can see with a pair of binoculars or a very small telescope. So if you get out there when Jupiter's in the sky uh, with a pair of binoculars, you should be able to see the moons of Jupiter and if you do the same thing over a few nights you'll actually be able to see that those moons move as they're orbiting around Jupiter. Okay so now we've uh, moved the telescope a little bit we're having a quick look at Saturn. This telescope is not really designed for looking at planets it doesn't really magnify enough but maybe we can have a look you might be able to see there's Saturn you can probably just about see the ring sticking out the side Galileo famously first had a look at Saturn and couldn't quite figure out what on earth he was seeing. He thought that the planet had ears, um, but the next subsequent generations of telescopes were able to show that there's this beautiful system of rings, which are little bits of boulders and rocks that are all in orbit around the planet Saturn. Um, and again, this is something you should be able to see, probably not with, a binoc with the binoculars, but if you can get a nice little telescope from somewhere, you should be able to see the rings of Saturn, or at least be able to see that Saturn has ears. Okay, finally on our tour of the planets, the last one we can see this evening is Mars, which is just up there in the sky. You may even be able to see it's a little bit of a reddish colour. I've actually got the telescope pointed at it again, so we can take a look. There it is. So Mars is the next planet out in the solar system from the Earth. Uh, it's a little bit further away, which means it goes around the Sun a little more, bit more slowly. That means the Earth orbits the Sun a bit quicker than Mars does. That means about every couple of years, the Earth overtakes Mars. It kind of catches up with it and overtakes it. It just so happens that we're actually at that point right now in, uh, in October 2020. We're at this point called opposition, which is the point where the Earth is overtaking Mars, which is the point on their two orbits where the two are closest together. So this is the best time of the year uh, to actually look at Mars and you can see that it is that little red disc. Um, but actually other times of the year, again, with a pair of binoculars, you'll certainly be able to see it in very deep red color. Uh, and with the telescope, you might just about be able to see that it's not just a point of light, it's actually a little disc. So one of the objects, one of the, the planets of the solar system, or maybe not, that's too small to see, too faint to see from here tonight is Pluto. And there's been a long running argument about whether Pluto is a planet or not. It's kind of a planet because it's orbiting around the sun like a lot of the other planets are. Um, but there are an awful lot of small bodies out there in the solar system. And in fact, more and more objects like Pluto are being discovered all the time. And because there are now so many of them, um, the International Astro Astronomical Union, which is kind of the world body of astronomy, decided to demote Pluto. And so that now it's only considered a minor planet rather than a planet. Or sorry, it's not even a minor planet, it's a dwarf planet is what it's referred to. Um, 
a lot of people ask, you know, is Pluto still a planet? The answer I always give is Pluto is still Pluto. It's still exactly the same object it was before. It's a fascinating object. Uh, and to be honest, Pluto doesn't care what we call it. That was brilliant and it must have been a great experience to go up on the roof so how was it yeah it was amazing i'm not the best with heights so it was a little bit scary to begin with but the view was just amazing you can see uh, nottingham castle you can see all the way out to franklin von sauer and kind of everything in between it was really amazing and and what was really cool is we were able to turn the lights off the hall so we could reduce light pollution as much as possible um, and that's the best way to see the night sky this week, actually, um, there's a citizen science project um, where researchers are asking people all around the country to um, see how many stars you can see near Orion, the Orion constellation, and that's to help them learn more about um, light pollution across the United Kingdom. Fantastic. I'm Megan, and I'm here with the Young Rangers at Aspera today. Um, and we're, we're chopping away, and you know what, it's really... Um, kind of therapeutic experience. I definitely recommend to anybody who just wants to get outside and take their energy out of something. It's uh, really great and obviously you have an impact on, on the space around you and nature as well. So um, I really recommend anybody to come and take part. Um, so this is Attenborough Nature Reserve. Uh, so it used to be a sand and gravel quarry um, and that was all exported out to make things like cement for building, concrete, things like that. Um, so there was originally um, several big quarry pits here which are now all lakes um, and then there was a processing plant as well which has all been sort of ripped down steadily over the years um, but I mean a lot of the nature reserves in Nottinghamshire were historically quarries um, after they've been quarried they do create amazing lake structures um, which can then be landscaped into wetlands with reed beds and it can create a really wide variety of habitats for a lot of different species and um, so this site in particular we have obviously the lakes we've also got a uh, reed bed wetlands and several wildflower meadows as well as the delta which is one of the few um, wet woodlands in the UK and um, so it's largely willow um, but that creates a really really rich habitat for a lot of species. During the breeding season in the summer, we can't really do very much habitat work because we can't disturb the birds as they're nesting. Um, so a lot of the work that we'll do in the summer will be things like fixing fencing, fixing benches, paths. Um, we'll do more kind of guided walks, things like that with the public sort of engagement things. Um, and then in the winter, that's when the fun really begins because that's when we can get our chainsaws out and start hacking up trees and doing all the scrub management. Um, but that kind of work, although it looks very extreme and destructive, it really paves the way for the following year for the, the flora to start coming out um, and then that means that there's more invertebrates for birds to nest and eat and things like that. What kind of stuff can people see down Attenborough in that kind of time of year? I mean like nature wise? Yeah. Um, so the winter is a brilliant time for us here because that's when we get a lot of the migrating bird species coming over. Um, so obviously they'll come in the summer and up north and then they'll be going back down again. Um, so we get a lot of really good wetland birds. Obviously there's the big draw like bitterns, um, so we have had them here before um, once they've nested, but quite often in the year you'll see or hear them um, and they're just fabulous birds to see, as well as things like the bearded tits that are you know, the really iconic wetland species that everyone loves to see. Um, we do have mammals here as well, so there's foxes, badger, uh, muntjac deer, Wow. Hedgehog, so you might be lucky and see things like that as well if you're here at the right time of day. So what are we doing? What are you? What are we working on today? So we're cutting back a lot of this bramble to um, clear the meadow and kind of make it a bit more of a useful space for wildlife because um, it's just going to take over and it's going to be a bit hard to access. Okay, and what other stuff have you done while you've been volunteering here? Um, while I've been volunteering here, I've um, done a similar thing at Skylark's Nature Reserve where I've, um, me and a team of people have cleared um, like a mound um, that had, was covered in brambles and planted wildflowers to make a wildflower meadow and we've also um, dug a trench around the San Martin hide uh, just over there and that stops the uh, invasive species, the mink, from kind of invading the San Martin's nest because they find it difficult to cross water.
Thanks to the Attenborough Young Rangers for letting us come down and film you earlier in October. There's actually another one of our artist commissions is, is based with Attenborough Nature Reserve as well this year. So we, um, Ryan Heath has been working with some young people um, creating some AR um, installations of signage. Now, if you've been watching Wilson and um, watch for the past few days, you know we've got an activity called Guess the Sound. Me and Megan are going to try and redeem ourselves since we haven't got any of them correct so far, but yes. So for today's sound, we've got this. So there's a quite a few noises in there, but we're trying to identify the kind of screechy uh, noise. And just a hint for people at home that this animal was introduced in Britain in the 19th century. It is really common now, so you probably see them around woodland or in your back garden. So get thinking, and after the break, we'll let you know the answer. Shall we hear it just one more time before we do go to the break, though? There's a little extra couple of seconds for you because it is a really tricky one today. We'll, uh, we'll see you after the break. <laughs> Welcome back and before the break we'll listen to our third mystery sound of the week. What did you think it was at home? Um, le let's maybe have another listener again. It's kind of like a screechy noise. I wasn't when I first heard of it. I thought it was like a bird, maybe. Yeah, it's not a bird. Um, it's actually a grey squirrel. Um, so if any of you at home guessed that right, that's really very well done because it was really really tricky. And as Jessica was saying, um, it's uh, grey squirrels were introduced to the United Kingdom. Um, and they're not actually native, it's the red squirrel that's the native species to the UK and that's actually really quite rare to see uh, these days. But if you've got them right so far, well done because they are very difficult. Um, now we're going over to Strawberry Hill Heath towards Mansfield. <laughs> Hiya, I'm Jamie. I work for Wildlife Trust, or Knott's Wildlife Trust. Um, you're joining me at Strawberry Hill Heath, uh, up in Mansfield, or kind of Mansfield, just on the outside of it. Um, yeah, we're here with a volunteer group, doing some habitat management, scrub management. You're not seeing them yet, but I'm sure we'll get some clubs done in a minute. Strawberry Hill Heath. The trust don't own it, Welbeck Estate own it, but we manage it for them. Uh, we might end up owning it at some point in the future. Uh, we'd love to, but I'd like to, because uh, it's one of our favourite sites in the area. Um, this and Renner Peak, which I think you visited this morning when you spoke to Steve. Um, we're part of the M2M project, so minor to major. Uh, myself and Steve, who you met this morning, and Charlene, um, we're all on the same panel um, that help look after the site. So my job title is Volunteer Coordinator. Obviously, uh, we're at Strawberry Hill Heath, um, so it is meant to be a heathland. It is a heathland, uh, there's quite a lot of heathland around us. There's also quite a lot of oak and birch uh, and pine on site. Uh, there is some projects in, in place to do a bit of veterinarisation of some trees. The guys today are actually removing some birch, some regeneration of birch uh, that was cut about five years ago. It's all coming back up again, so they're just chopping it out and adding back to a habitat stack, uh, which again adds a bit more sort of diversity to the site. So we have seen and had Nightjar on site, which is quite a rare bird. Uh, we have, I found them on site, we've had a, 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 a black deer, uh, well we have, I've seen six of them at one side, uh, and they crept up on me and jumped out at me, uh, not in an aggressive way, uh, but it did half make us run the opposite direction. Hello, uh, my name's Alex, um, I've been volunteering with the Wildlife Trust since October last year. Um, we are cutting down some birch trees because there is an awful lot of them in the area. Um, as you can see, it's pouring with rain, it's freezing cold. I have very, very numb fingers and toes, but I am doing this because we are restoring this back to what it should be, which is Heathland, and I love doing this.
Right, so um, with me you get Luna, so this is Luna, um, she's six years old, she's been with me, uh, well, coming out onto sites with me ever since she was 12 weeks old, or inje injected or vaccinated to come out onto site. So she's worked with lots and lots of young people, um, we use her as our therapy dog for keeping it wild, uh, but to keep her safe we have things like her own raincoat for when it's raining like today, uh, and I also have these which are all her booties that she has to wear. Um, so when we're working in sort of thorny areas or anywhere bramble or there might be like some smashed glass, uh, we pop these on and it helps to keep her little paw safe. Oh. Everyone always thinks you should never dress your dog up, anything like that. But you know when you're out all day long and it's freezing cold, I'm sure if you gave a dog the option of putting on a blanket to keep them warm or keep them out, they'll always choose the blanket. Come on. Dee -dee 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 -dee. <laughs> so she walks a bit dodgy, a bit funny for first. Um, and then she stops. How cute was Luna the dog? Um, it's so interesting to hear that she started working as a therapy dog when she was just 12 weeks old. Yes, I agree. And it was lovely to hear from Alex because the weather didn't look too nice <laughs> and she said her hands were numb because it was so cold. But it was lovely what she was doing. It was lovely to hear from her as well. Yeah, it was pouring down, but she still carried on and it's all for a good cause. Um, so great stuff. Um, um, so do send us your videos and photos. We want to hear more from you and we'll show them in the programme tomorrow if we get them through this evening. Next up, we have another one of Louisa's adventures and today she's introducing us to Rupert the Hedgehog. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another episode of Louisa's Adventures. This one's about hedgehogs. A hedgehog is a spiny mammal and it lives in Europe, Asia and Africa. Its distant ancestors are actually shrews. Hedgehog spines are made out of keratin. This is the same material that our hair and fingernails are made out of. When hedgehogs feel threatened, they can defend themselves by rolling into a ball, so that all the parts of their body that aren't spiny are still protected. Hedgehogs are omnivorous. This means that they eat both plants and animals. They eat a very wide variety of food. This includes earthworms, caterpillars, snails, slugs, even frogs and snakes. They also eat earwigs, millipedes, and mushrooms, grass roots, and fallen berries. That is a wide variety, isn't it? Hedgehogs can get into all sorts of trouble. They can get caught in netting, hurt by dogs, or trapped in garden ponds. If there is no way out a pond, their little legs can tire quickly from swimming. If you have a garden pond, make sure you can add a ramp, so if a hedgehog does fall in, it can climb out easily to safety. I have been given the very privileged and special job of releasing a hedgehog back into the wild. Meet Rupert. Rupert had been rescued and was rehabilitated by a good friend of mine named Tracy. I think he's sleeping a bit past his wake up time here, don't you? Rupert is an older hedgehog, about three years old. He was found lifeless next to a compost bin by a member of the public. He was dehydrated and very cold. He also had a huge tick infestation, which is a real problem for wild hedgehogs. Ticks are small, blood-sucking bugs that can make an animal feel very weak. After all the ticks were removed, Rupert was given rehydration fluids and housed in a breathable container with a nice warm towel. A warm water bottle was put underneath his towel every hour to help reduce the shock and increase his appetite. 
It took a whole nine days before Rupert was eating properly, though after then he really loved his food. He put on plenty of weight over the next six weeks until he reached a healthy weight to be released back into the wild. For hedgehogs to survive hibernation, they need to have enough fat stored up to last them through a cold winter. I hope to see you tomorrow when we'll be preparing for Rupert's release. Goodbye! Thanks for that, Louise. I'm really looking forward to tomorrow and finding out more about Rupert's rehabilitation. Me too. Next, we're going to keep on with our stargazing theme. On Saturday evening, there's going to be a special live stream event um, run by Showed Observatory as part of the Nottingham Festival of Science and Curiosity. Yes, that's right. The show Observatory is run by the Mansfield and Sutton Astronomical Society, who are all um, amateur astronomers and space enthusiasts. It's located in Sutton and Ashfield, and the society is actually hoping to build a new plan planetarium at the site over the next few years. Very exciting. On Saturday, the team will be running an event that's open to the public, and we'll um, be finding more about this um, when we speak to Brenda, one of our trustees of the society. Hi, I'm Brendan, trustee of Sherwood Observatory, um, home to Mansfield and Sutton Astronomical Society. We are located 14 miles north of Nottingham City, close to Mansfield. Come and join us for a one-hour special lecture on Saturday the 13th at 7pm. From Mansfield and Sutton Astronomical Society YouTube account, we'll take you on a journey covering the science and technology behind the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. That is the James Webb Space Telescope that's soon to be launched this year, later, about October, I believe. Also, we'll give you a tour of the winter night sky and focus in on the constellation of Orion the Hunter. And hopefully, should the weather um, permit, we will have a camera attached to a telescope and hopefully give you some uh, live images of the, the Orion Nebula within Orion itself. So, 7pm, Saturday the 13th, Mansfield and Sutton, YouTube uh, channel. See you there. Thank you. I'm really looking forward to that live stream event. Um, it's a really great way for us to be able to learn more about um, the Sutton Observatory while we can't actually go and visit. Um, and we'll be finding out about the new telescope that's heading into orbit. Um, remember to share with us your nature photos and videos on social media and um, we're really looking forward to seeing you after the break. Welcome back to Woolerton Watch, and isn't it lovely to be broadcasting from, to you live from Woolerton Hall? Yeah, it's such a special experience for us all here, so thanks to the guys for letting us um, come to Woolerton Hall. Um, but of course, we've been going around the county in lots of different areas, so we're going to head over to our map, um, and let's, let's go back through where we've gone already so far today. So, we were up in Strawberry Hill Heath, which is probably somewhere kind of here-ish on our map up near Mansfield. Then uh, we were talking a bit more about the Sherwood Observatory, uh, which is in Ashfield. So we're going to pop that on our map here. And then right at the start of the programme, we were also in Attenborough, which can go on up near our little swan here, over there. And then we've got one very uh, special uh, video to show you later on, um, but we'll put that on later. Um, so we're really looking forward to getting our map nice and busy. Um, that's very exciting for us. Um, so coming up next, we're heading over back to Skylark's Nature Reserve, which is in Rushcliffe, somewhere around here. Um, and uh, there's been lots more tree planting going on. So here's a little video of some of the volunteers getting those trees into the ground. Today is a chilly 1 degree Celsius at Skylark's Nature Reserve. 
Although these dedicated Nottinghamshire Wildlife Trust volunteers are committed to planting trees. Hi, uh, my name's Sheila. Um, I'm working for the Wildlife Trust, well, volunteering for the Wildlife Trust. I've been doing this for about a year. I love my Friday mornings here. I look forward to them. Since uh, Covid, it's lovely to be able to be back and doing this. And today we're planting some hedgerow uh, shrubs, uh, which is, I've uh, got here um, some um, dogwood and some elder buckthorn. The reason we're doing it, of course, is because it's good for um, the carbon footprint and, of course, for birds, grubs, everything that makes the um, food chain really. And because we're daft in this weather, we just like to do stuff like this. Right, we're off. Well, I'm Mavis and I've been working for the Wildlife Trust for a number of years and today I'm going to be helping the big tree planting day and I'm planting some um, Gelder Rose. So hopefully by spring we'll see lovely Gelder Rose trees. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> Well, there's lots of tree planting going on in Nottingham, isn't it? They're doing a brilliant job. Yeah, you can't stop tree planters in Nottingham. Even um, the wet weather, the great British weather doesn't stop them. Um, next up, we've got a really special film to show you. So back in April last year, Nottingham took part in, for the first time in the City Nature Challenge. So the City Nature Challenge is an international competition uh, where members of the public right around the world um, take photos and make recordings of nature using um, some apps and also um, some websites. Um, Nottingham was competing for the first time this year, last year, and was competing against other cities like Bristol and Liverpool and London. And actually, we did pretty well. We came top if you measured by the, the number of observations per city. So, and that's how we like to uh, um, monitor it. Um, so we asked um, an artist called Melanie Wheeler to make a little um, film about um, the City Nature Challenge, capturing how the project happened and, and using some of the images to make them into a film um, for us to show you the project um, right now. So just to note that there are some flashing images, it is an artistic interpretation, um, so just be aware um, that there are some flashing images.
So all of the images that Melanie used as part of um, her film were taken um, during the City Nature Challenge last year. So they were public photos that people just like you and me have taken. Um, the City Nature will be back uh, this year um, between the 30th of April and the 3rd of May. Um, so there'll be more information about um, how you can get involved. It's really easy. It's the kind of thing that you can do just by taking photos of wildlife in your backyard, on your balcony, down at the allotments or just in your local park. Yes, and after the break, we'll have another video from Sarah Robinson and we'll have loads of other interesting things as well. We'll also be going back to Mike and he'll be giving us some more tips about what to look out for in the night sky this month. We'll see you after the break. Welcome back. We hope you've been enjoying today's episode of Bulletin Watch so far. Don't forget that you can send in your photos and your videos um, on social media by tagging us at NotsFosac or by using the hashtag, hashtag Watch. Or you can email us um, WoolertonWatch at NotsFosac.co.uk. We'd love to hear if you have any local spots that you love or if you have any nice videos of nature. We'd love to hear it. I think a lot of people, well I certainly have been inspired by the videos we've been showing this week of, from Sarah Robinson, um, they're really lovely um, videos of urban wildlife um, showing animals in their kind of normal habitats. Um, so next up we've got Sarah's uh, video of the story of a bumblebee called Jeff. <laughs>
So I didn't realise before I'd seen that video that bees were still around in winter. I, I'd never really thought about that. Yeah, I didn't even know it either. So it's a really good tip, isn't it, for our viewers at home. Um, there's snow still on the ground in Nottingham, but we can try and see if you can see some bees over the next couple of weeks. Um, and if there's any of that gorgeous yellow mahonia around in your garden, or uh, if you live near to the University Park campus, maybe see if you can see, find some bees kind of buzzing away. Um, you might meet your very own Jeff. Yes. Now remember at the beginning of the programme we were on top of, um, on the roof of Wilson Hall. We um, filled that film before in October and we can't see the same thing that we've seen now in the sky so we asked Mike if he could film another video for us and to give us some tips of things we should be looking forward to this month in the sky. Hello, I thought I'd just uh, give you a quick update on some of the things you might want to look for in the night sky this month. Um, first of all, let's talk about what you need to look at the night sky. Well, actually, you don't need anything uh, other than getting outside and looking up is the main thing. If you've got a pair of these, a pair of binoculars, you can see things, you know, fainter things. You can make things a little bit bigger. You can make things a little bit brighter. But actually, a lot of what I want to talk about, you can actually just see with the naked eye. So then how do you know where to look? Um, well, just exploring is one thing to do. Um, if you've got one of these, got a phone, then there are a whole load of apps out there that actually allow you to see what there is in the night sky. Um, and they often have these things built in so you can actually point the phone to the bit of the sky and it'll have a map of that bit of the sky to tell you where you're looking. Of course, the slight downside to that is they tend to have quite bright screens, which means that you'll sort of destroy your night vision. You'll actually won't be able to see the stars afterwards because you'll be so dazzled from looking at the screen. A, a much simpler alternative is to get one of these. This is just a, a an evening sky map I downloaded. This one's from a sky, site called skymaps.com, but there are other ones out there as well, um, that gives you an idea of what there is in the night sky this month in the evenings. So let me just share that with you. There it is. So here's this map of the night sky, and it's got various things that are happening at various times during the, uh, during the coming month, um, but also this view of the sky overhead. And basically all you need to do is figure out which direction you're looking. Um, and so, for example, if you're looking south, then align south at the bottom here um, and hold the hold it up. I've even got it here. There we go. Hold it up with south at the bottom. If I was looking north, I'd hold it the other way up. And it gives me a view of what I should be able to see in that bit of the sky. So, for example, what's a good things to look at this month? Well, this month you can see Mars is pretty high in the kind of southwestern sky. So if you look southwest uh, about so this is set up for about seven or eight p.m. So in the evening, you'll see the r bright red dot of Mars. Um, and actually next to it, you can see there's this little circle with Pleiades written next to it. Pleiades would be a really good thing to take a look at. You can see it with the naked eye. It looks even more spectacular if you can point a pair of binoculars at it. Um, but the Pleiades is actually a stellar nursery. It's a place where um, less than 100 million years ago, which in astronomical terms is nothing, like this, that really is the blinking of an eye as far as the the universe is concerned, uh, stars started forming and you, you basically got the, uh, a view of the nursery in which these stars formed. Uh, the Pleiades is also known as the Seven Sisters. If you've got good eyesight, you might just about be able to see seven stars with the naked eye. But with a pair of binoculars, you'll see there are actually dozens of stars there. If you point a telescope at it, you find there are hundreds. Uh, if you look at this time calendar for the month, you'll notice that on the 19th, the moon joins in as well, because not only are the Pleiades and Mars close together, but you can see that the moon is near my, Mars and near the Pleiades. So 19th would be a great time to take a look at the moon, but of course any time will do. Um, again, great thing to point a pair of binoculars at, you'll start being able to see some of the craters on the moon. Um, probably best to do it not when the moon is completely full. When the moon's completely full, uh, the shadows are all very short on the moon, which means that you can't actually see the shadows of mountains and craters, so everything looks very flat. It's better when the moon's about half full. Um, and so when's that? This this month we're talking about sort of about the 4th of February and on to the 19th of February are the best times when the moon's about half full. And, the, and when it's like that, uh, you'll have plenty of the moon illuminated, but you'll actually be able to see a lot of the mountains and craters on there if you look through a pair of binoculars. So do check out the sky for yourself. Another thing you can do with a map like this is just start learning where some of the constellations are. So some of them are very instantly recognizable like Orion here, the Hunter, 
with the belt of three stars. It's just a good way of starting finding your way around the sky. There's the square of Pegasus over in the western sky. So lots of things to look at in the night sky. Find your way around. Make the most of these evenings because actually when it gets starts getting uh, dark very late, it gets much harder to do astronomy. So February, great time to be out there, but do wrap up warm. Some really great tips from Mike, so thank you very much, Mike. Um, yeah, and looking out of these very grand windows here, it's looking like a clear night, so it might be a good one to see if you can um, have a look at some of the, the things that Mike suggested that we take a look at tonight. We've had some really great videos coming in, um, so we're excited to show you. The first one we're going to um, is a video sent in by Noah, who's six years old, um, from, um, and this was taken in Colic Woods over the weekend. Isn't that so cool to see the robin yeah, land on him? Uh, next up, uh, we've got um, some a video of snow falling uh, a couple of weekends ago. So this was in the Arboretum, and I think we can see a pigeon, a brave pigeon, um, battling the snowy wind. And lastly, here's um, a video of some ducks. A photo of some ducks with their heads down um, in, in the water looking very funny. And our last video is of this gorgeous lake. Um, does anybody at home know where they think it might be? Recognise it from your local walks? Do let us know. Yes, it's been amazing, the videos we've seen today, but that's all for now, so thank you so much for watching. Tomorrow we'll be going over to Newstead Abbey and we'll be looking at some other fun word games from the Wildlife Trust. So tune in, uh, same time, same place, for more Willett & Watch. Thanks for watching. Bye! What?